people logging in. Every time that's one new person. Hey, good afternoon everybody. Our biggest concern right now is kind of that Red River Basin headwaters area. Over the last four days, things have started to melt in the far southern and far eastern part of our watershed. Dumont actually had a, a minor flood warning issued the last couple of days. Nothing real major yet, but I mean, it, it's pushing up against snow and, and ice pack. Dave Marshall, my technician, just checked the gauge at uh, Highway 75 on the Rabbit River and it's completely covered, no snow flow and the snow cover uh, on the fields is in the 95 to 100 percent range there. As soon as channels start opening up, we'll start measuring flows and uh, forwarding that information as we get it. Andrea at the RFC, I just wanted to say thank you for that awesome report. That's exactly what we're looking for and everything you said matches what we're modeling. So at least for today, we're in good agreement. We're an agricultural flood damage reduction slash adequate drainage type district here. It's kind of a balancing act. We have to give them decent drainage, but yet control the flows so they don't cause a flood on somebody else. At 9.34 this morning, it was 8.35. Oh, we got water coming from both branches now. And I know on this one here, there's ice right downstream from the channel. I don't think this is a good one to gauge. But we got water coming through from, on both 18 and 19 now, heading towards Dumont. Um, gauge 19 has opened up now and put pressure up on Dumont. At 7 o'clock last night, it was 7.65. A significant amount of flooding in the area south of the Rabbit River at Highway 75. During any flood event, you know, I get up in the air and try to figure out how much water is really going to run off and then from that we can kind of project what the likely downstream impacts are. It's a quick way to kind of get a sense for how, how big a flood you're likely to have. And then you can see problem areas that develop as they develop. As the basin with the water flowing north in the Red River, its inherent problem is that we're, we don't have the ice on the channel. At times when we're flooding in the Boise Sioux watershed, there isn't a drop of water yet in the Fargo-Moorhead area that hasn't started to thaw. They're 90% covered up there with snow up, up in oh. the Rabbit River area, up oh. by Campbell and that. Yeah, area. that's probably where oh, you're Oh man, start. eight inches of moisture in the snowpack measurements we were taking in the oh. Campbell area. And we were like four to... Four, four to, to five, yeah. yeah. You go north of Wheat and get north of the, the White Rock Dam Road, the fields are pretty much white yet. Yeah, there's a lot of snow out there yet. Yeah? Because they say spring comes north seven miles a day. Well, we're sending it in to the colder areas. It starts melting down here. It might be 20 to 30 days difference between when it starts melting here to there. As the melt starts and the contributing to the Red River, it starts at the Boyd Sioux watershed. Down here, I think we're going to be all right. Up there, it's going to yeah. get kind of nasty. but. I see they got a pile of sand over there. Are they going to fill some sand? Sounded bags? like I talked to Orville earlier and he said they were going to come over this evening and fill up a bunch of sandbags just in case. There's a storm that's a brewing on the sunset sky tonight. Same storm that's been a brewing since we first saw the light. So grab your fellow man. Take him by the hand, get your head out of the sand, and head for higher land. I'm gonna go up by that farmstead too. Down a JD-14 lateral two, is uh, bank full and actually overtop the road there by County Road 13. We've had as high as a thousand road washouts in our watershed in one disaster. When we get into a bad flood out here, we have people isolated that we could not get emergency crews to. I was a township clerk and I got called by one of the residents in the township that was flooding on a place that had never flooded, never had trouble. And the neighboring county was cutting the roads off to try and save their people while they were flooding everybody downstream. There was no coordination amongst counties. We carried them people out of there and the wife 
there on the place was my first and second grade teacher. We don't have enough trees, we don't have windbreaks, so our ag ditches fill up with snow. And they don't operate right away in the spring. And it's forcing the water to go overland that makes it own course when it starts overland. It's blowing out roads, it's flooding farmland, it's threatening communities. We're in my yard right now, standing next to the Rabbit River, four miles west of Campbell, Brandrup Township, and we're in the uh, Boydisu Watershed District. We have no fall either to the east, west, north, or south. In the normal spring, why we uh, have a lot of trouble with water in this area. Um, flooding in the fields, of course, is normal. We have probably have had four times where we've had water in our yard, six inches to three feet deep and then the flood of 97. Right where I'm standing right now, I'd have been standing in about a foot and a half of water. No matter which direction you looked, it was water as far as you could see. That was scary. The water just kept coming and coming and coming. I don't want to see, ever see anything like that again. If, if, if there's anything that anybody can do to solve a problem like that, it needs to be done. We've got a couple of backhoes working out in this area to get the channels open so that uh, the water will flow in those channels rather than spill out and go cross country. We did snow removal over in this area yesterday, uh, make sure that that's still working good. It's just kind of at the, at the peak right now and we're, yeah, it all depends upon weather too and how quick it wants to melt. So we're gonna hold off as long as we can and hopefully get the crest at Dumont to, to go down. No sense putting any more pressure on it. You keep in touch with me with what's happening here in your yard, too. Yeah. Monica called me and said you had called and wanted me to come down here, so. Boy to Sue, Monica. Hi. Two full-time employees at the Watershed District, and uh, and then we, through the school year, we pull in a, a work study that helps with some of the clerical stuff in the office. And we consult with an engineering firm. The firm has a number of staff that we utilize for our services. We've got a district engineer, he's a hydraulic engineer by profession, that's Charlie Anderson. This is the Mastinka River that flows all the way down into Traverse, starts up here in Ottertail County. This is the 12 mile creek system from the south that flows up, ends up in the Mastinka River and, and down there. And then this is the Rabbit River area right here that flows over into the Bois de Sioux and the Doran Creek that comes in just south of Breckenridge. This is Lake Traverse, that's Mud Lake. There's uh, what they call White Rock Dam. That's the outlet of, of the Lake Traverse project. And from there to where it hits the Ottertail River is the Bois de Sioux. You know, Breckenridge, which is the outlet of the Bois de Sioux, the Ottertail comes into Breckenridge. Everything flows to the north and every road is, serves as a dike, north and west. So I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna check this, uh, this gauge site up here, gauge site number five, quick. 11.55 is what the gauge reading is on gauge five right now. I record the date, the time, the, the elevation, and I put comments in there about what's the condition of the channel. We've got all that record for 20 years. Just helps us to better understand how the water moves through our district. By monitoring these two spots, we know what's gonna happen here in Dumont. We're sitting okay. All right, thanks, Tom. And we're answering the public's questions. We're sending information to the Weather Service daily. We're giving them stream gauge readings, flow readings. They punch all this stuff into their model, their computer model, and then they use that for prediction down on the main stem. Nine, four. When things really get rolling, we've got two gauging crews out here, and Charlie and I are moving around trying to set the pace for where they got to go next. Okay, are we ready? Yeah. We're measuring the flow through these box culverts using a meter. Divide the box culvert into sections that are marked off with the orange paint. And each one of those sections, we uh, drop the meter in and take two measurements at a uh, predetermined distance from the height of the water. Eight, two. Okay. We enter that into the spreadsheet. And when we get all finished, it calculates the flow that's going through this location at this time. We keep these to uh, determine where in the watershed uh, the water is coming from. We can actually measure what is happening in this part of the watershed and what, uh, what contribution it's making to the downstream area. And stop. Here 
here. Okay. We've got the gauging station set up out there and we monitor those flows and we monitor those stages. If it's a gaugeable site, maybe the gauging crew will want to gauge it today. And any opportunity we get to measure that again, we keep measuring it because it just refines that data even better. And dispel a lot of myths, a lot of uh, disagreements. They always say whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. Well, we're putting the, the kibosh to a few of these fights. <laughs> the thing I'm concerned about is opening this channel here. Dumont is still going up. Yeah, a day or so, because it's already up now. It's not gonna. Yeah. I'm thinking we'll keep an eye on this, and I'll keep checking them gauges, you know, at Dumont and then a mile south here, and see what they're doing. When they start to drop, then I think we could pull this open if we have to. Yeah, and it doesn't. It doesn't run really good till no. the creek gets down anyway. Right. You know, it's, right. Uh, Flooding is such a major problem in the Red River Valley that anytime we're going to do something to fix that or reduce that the money's gonna be there, we'll find it. We live in an ag society here, but we, our population centers are Fargo-Moorhead, which extreme flooding happens. And ag drainage is gonna take the brunt of that blame. All the people in the valley, they're part of the problem. This is a basin problem, and it's gonna take a basin solution. Retention Authority. The Retention Authority was started by the two large managing water boards from Minnesota and North Dakota. We needed to work together. The Minnesota side, the Minnesota Water Management Board is made up of the watershed districts that feed the Red River from the Minnesota side. We spent about a year and a half setting down with the environmentalists and we hammered out a mediation agreement. How a watershed shall approach their impoundment areas and what we can do to enhance the natural benefits. We got away from political and we got to the science engineers from just about all the organizations, including the Corps, the DNR. No policy people can sit on that committee. That's a no-no. And when we deal from that, there ain't much to fight about. The fight's about over when you've got the science behind you. Since we've had that agreement, we have not had one lawsuit against DNR in the Valley. Everything works together by project teams now. Everybody who's involved in it, I mean from the environmentalists, local landowners to the watershed, sit on these project teams and come up with the best alternative. You get to the point where you have to try something. What you have isn't working at all, so you gotta go in a different direction. We've been in favor of uh, water retention projects for many years now. If we can make it better for us living here on the farm, it's gonna be a benefit for the people that are living in town. Whether you're a farmer or a city person, there's local flooding issues that have gone on in their watershed that maybe they looked at building levees and dikes and other measures before. What can retention upstream of the problem do? Hold that water temporarily. This, these are dry dams. We want to hold the water as the shortest period of time possible until the downstream flooding has subsided. That's what retention is. It's fairly common sense. We're looking at a, a basin-wide uh, river map here. Close to the river, it melts early. This kind of orange or area, that's kind of the, the hot spot. It's the snow that's melting and hitting the river coming in right when it's peaking, so it contributes to its peak. This is kind of the sweet spot on the North Dakota side, on the Minnesota side where we want to build projects because that's the river water that, that's the most damaging to us because it hits the peak. A major a emphasis uh, in the last few years has been uh, developing a, a flow reduction strategy for the Red River, commonly called the 20% flow reduction strategy. They picked that number from the 1997 flood in Grand Forks. If they would have taken 20% off the flow of the Red that year, Grand Forks would have made it. And that would enhance a lot of the flood protection and the dikes that already exist up and down the valley. The way that is envisioned to be accomplished is through distributed storage and many smaller and maybe some larger projects throughout the entire Red River Basin. How many projects would be in there we're not sure but the goal is 1.5 million acre feet of storage up and down the valley and each watershed has kind of an allotment or a goal of its own. It's a multi-faceted approach to solve many local problems as far as where the sites can and should be but also on the bigger picture of what the basin can do collectively as far as doing retention. 
for the Bois du Sioux to do its share takes about 100,000 acre feet of gate control storage. Our priority is to fix the problems right here in our own district. How much land is that going to take out of production? One acre foot is a foot of water on an acre of land. If you can store 5,000 acre feet per section, you're talking about 20 square miles, less than 2% of our watershed area. And we've got 26 different sites identified that we could control water in to reduce our contribution to the red by 20%. Any kind of land comes up for sale, I've got a map to look at and say, hey, that's kind of in the area that we might want to build a project. In 1997, if we'd have had those, all those storage facilities built, we would have reduced the flows at Dumont 47%. A huge difference in our own local flood damage right. reduction and still provides our 20% reduction in contribution to the rest of the valley. The trick is to make sure that you're providing local benefits. So far, our projects have all been landowner driven, actually. They come to us and say, I got a piece of ground I want to sell you. I think it'll work for, for some storage. You want to take a look at it. Or we look in the paper and see land for sale and it may, it may fit our needs, so we'll look at it. And using our retention projects to solve those issues first and foremost, that's going to be the key because the funding will come from the local watershed and that's where the planning comes from, that's where the permit will go, that's where the operation plan comes from. We had a discussion at our staff meeting about this. We're the muscle that puts the project on the ground. We are the headwaters. It all starts here. And they have five project teams working now. The largest of those is North Ottawa. Project teams working on more in the future. Okay, North Ottawa is right down here. On uh, North Ottawa, you know, the original idea there to, to build an impoundment uh, really originated with the water manager on the Bois Sioux board. He had in mind maybe a quarter section or a half section where we could store water down in the area that frequently flooded. They used to call this the Tinta Slough. I've got pretty good aerial photos from earlier floods that show, you know, 10 square miles or so flooded out in that area. These are the lands that were flooded most years. You can see that by how many owners there have been that tried to farm this land, how many ditches they've tried to get the water out of this area. A landowner came to us and said, hey, I got some land I want to sell. It's kind of marginal. You think you could use it? We took a look at the, the land, I sent the information over to Charlie and he said, yeah, I could build a storage area there. So our thought was to take that water that currently floods 10 square miles and try to concentrate it on a smaller area and then prevent any release of that water from going downstream and harming people along the way. I was looking at two things really in, in figuring out how big this ought to be. And the first, of course, was make it big enough so that you're sure it'll work. Gathering the water from a higher elevation upstream and then bring it into the impoundment area uh, through a diked inlet channel. That way we can store water up to about 14 feet deep and on an average about 10 feet deep over the, uh, the three square mile impoundment. It took a lot of convincing to get the people to, to go along with, with the ideas that we had. The local people in general were receptive to something small, but somewhat overwhelmed by the larger size alternatives that we were looking at. There were some doubters and some detractors, and certainly it was controversial at the time. Major landowner concerns on the loss of tax revenue. We went down to the legislature, we worked on it, we was able to get the watersheds, the availability in the Red River Valley to, to do payment in lieu of taxes. Even, even ourselves, we were skeptical of, of whether or not something like this would work. We worked a lot with the local township board. They too weren't that comfortable with the idea, but at least it was a way to communicate what we were trying to do. When we do want to buy the land to put into a project, it is more costly. But you got to get down to the, the basic economics with the landowners to say, we're going to help some things upstream, we're going to help some things downstream. So if we can turn some of that land in the bottom of the retention area, if you can hold water on it for 10 days or two weeks, 
upstream of Wapaton Breckenridge or the Bois Sioux River, holding that water until that river is crested and the flood threat has passed. They proceeded with the project, they kept working on it, they kept working with the landowners trying to explain the benefits that were going to become because of this project. You've got to get permits, you have to get money, so the funding organizations were involved all along the way. Major funding, of course, from, from the Red River Watershed Management Board in the state of Minnesota, as well as the Boyd Sioux Watershed itself. North Ottawa is in the process for 10 years in our watershed. Our landowners are looking towards the basin perspective. They're cooperating, and that, that's a key for us. The North Ottawa impoundment itself is in the Rabbit River portion of the Bois de Sioux. The upstream area feeding it is outlined partially in this heavy line and then partially by the diversion channels that we, oh. that we built. That's about 75 square miles. The total drainage area of the Rabbit River at its mouth is about 320. We're driving up along the south diversion channel right now. We're in that half mile jog area. The diversion channel's plumb full. We've got eight and a half miles of collector channel or diversion channel brought then down to what we refer to as an inlet channel, which is a dike channel leading to the impoundment itself. The inlet channel is diked on both sides. It's about a mile and a half long. The diked inlet channel is what gives us the capacity to hold water up to about 10 feet deep in the uh, impoundment area itself. And you'll see the header channel that goes north. Everything on this side continues on its way all the land on this side of us, on the left side of us, is now top of the hill. And here's the weir. We got water going over the weir now. So we're taking water into Pool C. But I'm going to grab a picture of this and give it to Charlie. We put this weir right in here so that we would hold water higher and it would run it north down that header. We call it a header channel. The impoundment is designed to capture and store four inches of runoff, the 100 year spring runoff event. Once it's in the pool, we can shunt it in different directions and flood different parts of the impoundment. With the current configuration, if we did have more than could be handled by the one square mile pool, uh, it would start flooding in and start filling up that whole two square miles. We're putting everything we can into pool C on the far west edge, and when it gets full, then it'll start automatically filling into pools A and B. I don't know if we'll get enough water to do that, we might, but there's less water than for us to get off of pools A and B and we'll take it off of there first so they can get in there and farm it because those are all leased out. They, they pay us to do that. This is our pressure relief valve. Before it would overtop the perimeter dike or this dike that we're standing on, it'll spill over this spillway. It can take the water out of here as fast as it's coming in. Following the flood, we drain it down as soon as the channels can handle it to about 4,000 acre feet. We've got six outlets that basically lead into ditches that were there before. There's some snows. There's, that must be the spouting plot. You fill up a great big three square mile bathtub and when it's safe to let it go, you open up the drain and let it go. We've got six drains in our bathtub that we can open up and depending on which way is better to send the water, north or west. We've never let water out of this project until the crest is passed at Fargo. So we're uh, 
We're probably 200 acre feet. Okay. The ultimate goal is to have it divided into nine individually operable pools. The entire pool, all, all three square miles, are available in the spring for flood control. Following spring runoff, we try to drain down the eastern pool, which is two square miles, and get it drained down in time to, to plant crops in there. We'll see you as about 400 acre feet in there. Okay. When we get the other partitions built in there, then we can more selectively decide which, which pools would be flooded in the event that you needed that storage in the summer. This one has been fully operational since 2010. We filled it in 2011 to within 200 acre feet of full gated control. It was quite a sight. It was three square miles of just solid water. <laughs> this project by itself reduces the peak flows at Tinta by about 50 percent. The existing levee system that they have in town, you know, can now protect them quite easily. Since we put the North Ottawa project in, the town of Tinta has not had to sandbag a bit. Tinta used to be always a big problem area and we've essentially eliminated the flood from them. Further downstream, the next place on the river is Wapaton and Breckenridge, you know, and they have their level of protection built to a certain height, storing their water in North Ottawa. You can take some of that peak off so they have more freeboard within the dikes and the structures they already have built. That's just a win for them too. And hence it will go downstream all the way to a Fargo Moorhead. And it's worked marvelously ever since it first operated. You know, 2009, 10, and 11 were all big water years in the valley. And again this year, it stored water. It's a great model from many perspectives. Everything around it now dries out three to four weeks earlier than what it did before. They were actually in the field that much sooner than what they had been. The water retention area that uh, the Boy de Sioux is in charge of, it turned into a win-win. It controls the spring runoff, and we've never had a problem with water since then. And you have to realize there's two floods, a flood in the spring and a flood that could happen in June. In the summertime, which was probably our main concern, that's what we're looking at as far as the, the biggest benefit to get out of that is being able to hold that big rain that's upstream of us. It'll be metered out in a way that the river can handle it and still give us a chance to get rid of our water. If you run into a summer where it's kind of wet in the whole entire area and upstream of us why they would get a, a big rain like a four or five or six inch rain, why that water all comes barreling down the river without any controls to it and then the river will probably uh, start backing up into our fields and of course when that happens why our crop is, is pretty much going to be destroyed. If we get a big summer rain it would wipe all of this out down here. It only maybe sit three, four, five inches deep out there, but if it sat for more than a day, it took the crop. That's a bad deal for this area. When farmers lose a crop, they basically lost the fuel, the fertilizer, everything that went in to trying to grow the crop. I think it was the second week of June, we had about three and a half inches of rain come down and there was surface runoff the fields. And all the surface runoff, it looks like a chocolate malt. It always does. I mean, the soil is just floating in the water going downstream. Most of the erosion that we have uh, off the ag land and most of the pollutants that come off the ag land come off during periods of high runoff. If you can do a better job of controlling the runoff, the water quality in the downstream areas will, will be that much better. Everybody has, has kind of come to the same conclusion that it, it does help. People have uh, kind of changed their tune a little bit. Uh, a lot of people were skeptical about this idea when we first started, but now they see it on the ground and they see how it functions and they see that it is possible to continue doing some ag production inside them. We've gained a lot more acceptance. One of our major opponents of the project is renting land inside the project area. We got cash rent approaching $400 an acre inside the flood impoundment before it was less than 100. They know unless it's a catastrophic June rain, we can keep the water off of that. We got a dike all the way around it and we take the water that comes in that might have flooded that crop and put it on the one square mile. We actually produce more crop out there now on less acreage and there's certainly less environmental impacts associated with that. 
We've increased the productivity of the land inside the impoundment. The people downstream that would get the uh, spring flood, 20 sections of land improved there, not even counting what we're doing for the city of Breckenridge and Fargo. That one section has made a lot of sections tremendously better. By renting it out, we have a fund, a maintenance fund for the projects, pay the local taxes, have a good ag economy. That's what we're all about out here is an ag economy. The more projects that we can get like this, why the more help we're going to get out of them. We're proven to the ag community that we can use flood control units for flood control and still farm parts of them. It's been a pretty good example of how you can build flood control impoundments on a non-traditional landscape out in the flat country, which is what we have in the Red River Basin. There aren't a lot of real natural dam sites. And I think it exceeded all of the expectations as far as the storage working very well, the upland or the upstream areas being drained better, that was done. The natural resource enhancements, I think that exceeded people's expectations too. It provides base flow for the Rabbit River. And you take a year like last year when they were distributing a little water into the Rabbit River. We've got our northern spawning. The fingerlings never get back to the lake because the rivers go dry. This way we can put a continual flow in that river. We break our spawn back to the lake. It, it's countless the number of things that this will do by taking care of the water. Thousands and thousands. The use by waterfall of the impoundment is, is really more than anyone anticipated. We get a lot of migrating birds in the spring and we get a lot of migrating birds in the fall. And we also have an awful lot of nesting birds out there, uh, which was totally unexpected. Virtually all of the migratory waterfowl species in Minnesota at least made an appearance there. Two years ago in the spring, when the wildlife migration was going on, at that time we had all three sections. She was at capacity full. And the Minnesota DNR commissioner come out and he took one look and he said the filming crews will be here tomorrow. And then we keep one whole section for a pond during the summer. The environmental benefits and the birds, they're living on that one section, not the three. The egg production is, in that instance is an environmental benefit because we can have the guy take the crop off and leave the stubble and we can flood it and ducks can go in there in the fall. We can manage that, whether it be shorebirds or ducks. If you think about wetlands, you're typically thinking about natural wetlands. You know, it doesn't m mimic a natural wetland. But in terms of function, you know, the birds don't care if it's square or round or what we really end up with is pools out there that we can manage quite closely to relatively ideal pool levels. The main thing we were trying to develop in the way of natural resource benefits was for migrating birds, both waterfowl and specifically for shorebirds, which have been in decline for many years. That just fits really well with a flood control project typically works, and that is that you've got water most springs, and you need to have it drawn down before the next big flood, which is usually in the spring. But in that interim period, then between the last spring flood and the next spring flood, you can manage those levels and actually provide that shallow water kind of mud flat area that shorebirds really feed on. We've concentrated the wildlife in there and it just, I, I had seen a win-win the whole way on it. Since this, you know, with putting the projects on the ground, you can't expect the locals to bear all the financial burden. And that's one thing the mediation agreement has done. It's brought the environmental people to the table, not only in person, but with money. We consider DNR environmental or the Minnesota Environmental Advocacy Group. We've had Audubon set at the table. Nature Conservancy. These people will go to the legislature and lobby for money for the watersheds now before it was non-existent. I mean, it's met all of its obligations and the things it's promised. I'm an update on the Red Path project. And their projects in the Boyd-Sioux watershed have now been easier because people say, well, yeah, that's what it's supposed to do. And yeah, I guess you guys can deliver on what you said you can do. So future projects should be a little bit easier.
because of the fact that one being so successful. And there's certain areas in the watershed, all over our watershed, we've got that exact problem. And each and every project is going to try and address that. Keep the water off a good egg lamp. You know, pick a spot and let's use that spot, but let's use it for more than flood control. It's certainly nice to see the water from the 75 square miles that are controlled by the North Ottawa project basically feeding into a storage unit with no water coming out. It's been a good example that others can look at and say, yeah, you know, maybe something like that would work in our area as well. And we're looking at others that are similar in the Bois de Sioux. So much of our problem can be taken care of at a local level by just a little common sense and the guys working together. I mean, if they don't want something on their land, we can find some land and do the treatment. We can do it for them in a group or community way. Everybody got some benefit out of it. The, the farmland is still there to be farmed. The uh, wildlife waterfowl is there in the spring. They tried to make it a win-win situation for everybody. It's functioned perfectly since we built it. It's done everything it was designed to do. We've made some believers out of it now. People aren't saying, gee, I don't know if I want one of those. They're saying, I think we need more of these. Let's build one down in my area. Our project team processes have gotten so busy in our watersheds because everybody wants something done in their area. Our watershed, we're challenging. We're trying to lead out to try and help the producers for the area. What we do for them invariably helps the bigger picture helps the Red River. I think now everyone out there sees how it can work, so there's no doubters anymore. I haven't had any complaints. Every watershed is trying to do something. Every watershed is trying to build impoundment. Now we've got another project designed. The hardest thing to do is acquire the lands that you need in order to build these kind of projects. They're not built on what would be traditionally thought of as, as second class or, or wasteland. We're out in a prime agricultural area. What I think the Bois de Sioux Watershed District has tried to do is be quite patient about it and slowly acquire the lands that you need then over time and when you reach kind of a critical mass there, go ahead and build the project. A lot of projects like this add up to a meaningful reduction in flow on the main stem. If you ask most any water manager what's the number one concern in the Red River Valley, well it's flood control. It actually causes flooding. But the water quality question that we've got to deal with. Anytime these impoundment areas come in, that's a sediment basin. We're dropping uh, suspended solids out. We're dropping a lot out of the water. Anytime we're doing this flood work, we're cutting back in the stream bank erosion. Well, if we can give some relief to the flow on that, would reestablish their natural bank that's been eroded away. We're in the process of setting this up for biomass harvesting, cattail harvesting. By taking the cattails off them 600 acres, we'll be removing about 6,600 pounds of phosphorus. That's a lot of phosphorus out of the inflows to Lake Winnipeg. By doing that, we've taken 75 sections of land and done really their water quality work for them. Those owners in that area just had a big load taken off their shoulder. We should be able to put together areas in our impoundment areas to do a lot of work on the landscape to help farmers to do their share. But to me, that's the wind situation in water quality that I'm seeing for our particular watershed right now. A sustainable removal system, and we're doing it on a flood control project. I'm encouraged to see this work because this is a major step towards water quality in the Red River and beyond. The water quality issues are coming to the forefront. Nitrate is going to be a coming issue because our water flows to Canada. We're getting to the day that the decision is going to come from higher up than us. 
probably the first ones will be the United States State Department and the Canadian State Department. We provide 30% of the water and 70% of the nutrients going in the lake. Something's out of whack there. At some point in time, this has got to be handled to capture and go out on every farm and do what would be necessary to address water quality. Would it be cheaper for the state of Minnesota to do regulations instead of incentives? And I think we best be prepared to try and handle something ourselves rather than let somebody else handle it for us. With the technology we have, with the smart farming, with the variable rate fertilizer, we can take care of it. Well, that's what you want. Probably the last five, six years I've contemplated doing tiling. We've told the landowners that are upstream from that project, they obviously have drainage problems too. They could do some drainage improvements up there because we have a place to put the water. In the very beginning, we drew out the plan for pattern tiling. My role when someone like Brian walks in is, okay, show me what you want to do. I look at it from our watershed perspective and say, yeah, I think we can make this work. Maybe if we tweak the design a little bit here or there. As time went along, we just always had in the back of our mind we were going to put a shutoff system on it. It's a level control flow. It's like a miniature little yeah, dam thing in the ground. You can regulate the height of the water table. and. We've got something now. We can get the water table down. We can get on there in the spring and not fight this high water table. And at the same time, don't overdo it. We can hold this water back and hopefully July and August, we'll have some of that water to use. When we look at it from a quantity standpoint, the times that we need storage in the soil for water are times when he doesn't care because he doesn't have a crop growing on it. It's in the spring. And then if he's got the ability to dry it out in a reasonable amount of time, we don't care what he does with this structure through the summer. He can manage it for his crop. I am going to, in the next year's time, back up further in the main header system. We're going to install one more of these. It's a nice piece of ground the way it's laying. There's about three feet of total variance in the ground from the highest to the lowest point. And that should give us a little better control of the whole field. Pretty ideal for making something like this work. You can hold some of this back in the soil and it doesn't have to all take off, helping a double situation, drainage and holding something back. When you put the controls on, it gives you an opportunity to control nutrient load. To me, it's a simple solution. Farmers will see 15 to 20 percent yield increase by managing the system. If you're thinking about doing controlled drainage, you got to plan ahead. Hopefully we can convince some people that this is the right thing to do. If it doesn't rain a whole lot, Tiling contractors are really keying yeah. in on this too. If we operate these types of things properly, we can actually help reduce peak flows on the red. At this point in time, there is more cooperation happening than has ever been done in the Red River Valley. Everybody sits on the flood damage reduction group from NRCS to FSA, DNR, MPCA, Corps of Engineers. You know, we have farm groups on it and trying to develop policy how we can keep moving forward. Work on a watershed basis with a one plan. We have that now passed through the legislature. So we're coordinated up and down the valley because our watersheds are represented from here to the Canadian line. So you have to have kind of a series of projects throughout your watershed to hold that water as it's causing you problems with putting together all of the pieces, the components, making sure all of the parties at the table are happy with the project and how it's gonna be done if the money were there, it still takes four to five years to put the project together from the beginning to the end. We'll be building projects probably over the next 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 years. So one at a time, we'll have to chip away and get these things done. The North Ottawa project, it's been a prototype. We've had a lot of people out of Washington to see it. That's a consensus building amongst the environmental groups and the local groups. It took us a hundred years to get where we're at, people trying to fix the drainage problems in the area. It's going to take us a while to swing it back the other way where it's a little more tolerable. It really does kind of empower water managers who are typically more observers during these major events that actually have things they can do to reduce the flood impacts. Now you actually have a lever you can pull. It is a real good feeling. I find this just to be really neat. I, I like to see the wildlife. Swan's right next to the road, you bet. 
You'll see swans all over the place around here now. In the last 10 years, before that, it was very, very seldom you'd see a swan. And now, yes, they're part of the migration route. You look off in the front in the distance, it's all birds up there. And the DNRs always talked about the uh, corridor issue. We can build a corridor with these projects. We can build exactly what the wildlife needs. One landowner. After everybody saw the benefits that were going to be realized from the project, I think most everybody has come around to the idea that we can't hold all the water. It's got to be up and down the whole valley. It's going to take a bunch of them. I've been told by the engineers that it would probably take three or four of them just to keep our smaller river in check right here. If there's going to be more of these projects that come into reality in the next few years, why we'll get just that much more benefit out of it. I think North Ottawa is kind of the prototype of what can and will be done in the future. 